Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar on country-based pooled funds. My name is Caroline Kreling and I work with the German Association of Development and Humanitarian Aid NGOs called Venro and I'm responsible for organizing all the humanitarian trainings and webinars that we offer for NGOs. Today we are about 30 participants from different local and international NGOs and also colleagues from the Federal Foreign Office and from German embassies are taking part. So today we will have a little discussion round with the Afghanistan Pooled Fund Manager Jens Oppermann from UN OCHA and he will first give us an overview about pool funds in general and the Afghanistan Humanitarian Fund and then you will have the chance to pose all your questions that you have regarding CBPFs. So if you want to pose your questions please use the little chat box that is located in your webinar window. The questions will be sent to me and then I will read them out after the input of Jens. And so if you want to write down anything regarding questions you have, currently based on funds, the allocation process or anything else, please write down all your questions also during the input and we will come back to them later. And please also note that this webinar will be recorded. And now I would like to welcome and turn over to Jens Pommern. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And the floor is yours. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, first of all, good morning. My name is Jens. I'm, as explained, the uh, fund manager for the Afghanistan Humanitarian Fund, and I'm working with you in Ocha. And yeah, part of my role as the head of humanitarian financing is to manage the Afghanistan Humanitarian Fund, the EHF but also the manage uh, surf allocations in Afghanistan. And yeah, Caroline and I met um, a few months ago uh, at a great meeting that we had at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Berlin. And we discussed there um, various aspects of our country-based pool funds, such as also how German NGOs can access best country-based pool funds, keeping in mind the increasing significance of country-based pool funds globally. And then, yeah, great to, to have this meeting today. And while talking about this, we thought it's a good idea for you to get an opportunity also to yeah, ask questions and to have a rather open discussion about country-based pool funds, rather than me giving you, let's say, the standard presentation about what Ocha is doing globally. And so, as I explained, um, idea is just to yeah, give you a bit of an overview about country-based pool funds as a start. And we put this little agenda together. I hope you can see it um, anytime soon on your screen. So we thought we're giving it <clears throat> five minutes for introductions, maybe quickly. Then I talk for about 10 minutes about general CBKF information and resources. There's always a question, I believe, about where to find what information, especially if you come to a new country or you want to engage with an organization um, with a country-based pool fund, let's say in Afghanistan. And then to give it about 45 minutes to yeah, give you ample room for questions and to have a discussion about any kind of matters you would like to yeah, discuss with me or always wanted to ask. Okay, so let's go and talk a little bit about country-based pool funds. So on this first slide, I'm trying to give you a bit of an overview about the increasing significance of country-based pool funds over the last several years. And country-based pool funds by design or started pretty much way back in 2006. So many of you who are, let's say, as old as I am or as long around as I am, can still remember the time of the ERFs. Um, that was the first model uh, we used for country-based pool funds or for pool funds. And then later on, this model was changed into the so-called CHF, the country, uh, the Common Humanitarian Funds. And then sometime in 2014-15, we revised the whole model into what is now called the CBPFs, the country-based pool funds. And so country-based pool funds are one model uh, nowadays, or now that OCHA is managing. The other one is, of course, SURF, the Central Emergency Response Fund. And uh, those of you working with INGOs specifically, of course, you're well aware that SURF funding is only accessible by UN agencies. Well, of course, that's a reality. Often subcontract um, or partner with INGOs and local NGOs 
in order to use these funds then later on, while CBPF funds are of course accessible directly by NGOs. And as a matter of fact, majority of recipients of CBPF funding are NGOs. Uh, it's usually most or the largest numbers are NGOs, often followed by local NGOs and then by the UN. It depends a little bit on the country and it depends a little bit on the context on who is best placed. And that's, um, of course, always a topic for us that it's not a straight, let's say, separation or clear separation of how much funding goes to which type or agency type. But of course, country-based pool funds working closely with the cluster system are, of course, aiming to disperse funds to the ones that are best placed. And we might need to talk a little bit maybe about that one in the discussion, the role of clusters and uh, how money of country-based food funds is allocated. So when we look at the slides, and I hope you can see it, you see that in 2018, and I'm just going by last year, uh, country-based food funds received an overall contribution from donors of a value of about 950 million. That is a significant increase or a gradual increase over the years. And I think it demonstrates quite nicely the increasing importance of country-based pool funds, of course, also as a funding mechanism for NGOs, for example. And so with 950 reached, we last year um, dispersed 836 million to partners, and the remaining amount is carryovers. So this is money that is still being used, of course, in 2019. None of the money that pool funds or OCHA is receiving is ever been, let's say, given to any other purpose than what the donors intended it for, meaning the money stays in country if it's not being spent. It will be spent there at a later time, in the next annual year. And of course, also any money that agencies return back to the fund, uh, for example, ineligible costs or a project couldn't be fully implemented, are later returned to that specific fund and is then again available for uh, allocation in the next round. So looking at the donors, um, Germany is an increasing donor uh, in terms of contribution to country-based pooled funds. Uh, traditionally or historically, the UK um, gives a little bit more. I guess that might change over time. And then we, of course, have other significant funders, uh, donors such as, for example, Sweden, Netherlands, Belgium, and so forth. You see next to the name and the flags of the countries, CBPFs, we had 17 CBPFs in 2018, and this year we have 18, we started in Ukraine at the start of the year. The largest sums of money um, went to Yemen, Turkey, DRC, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Iraq, and so forth. And you see, of course, here also that a lot of money usually goes to the very prone, very media, let's say prone uh, emergencies and, of course, what everybody is at the moment interested, of course, is um, humanitarian responses in Yemen and Turkey and DRC, Ebola crisis, South Sudan, and so forth. And Afghanistan received 46 million last year. This was mainly in order to respond to a drought, um, which mobilized quite some resources last year. Uh, and we were quite well, I'd say we did quite well in terms of dispersing uh, investment of funds. We dispersed 62 million, so there were some carryover, about 20 million that we had from the previous year. And then a little bit further on the right hand side, you see how country based pool funds, as I mentioned earlier, um, disperse funds. So out of the total amount of 900 or 836 million, Last year, about 360 million went to international NGOs, um, followed by UN agencies, 31%, 25% national NGOs. And of course, we're also supporting the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, Crescent uh, movement organizations in some countries. So Afghanistan is one of them. I think we're the only country based pool fund that uh, is supporting the IFRC. And that, of course, makes up also. Um, all the eligible organizations able to receive funding from country-based pool funds, meaning any kind of corporate entities, meaning any kind of governmental entities are, of course, not uh, eligible to receive funding. So funding was strictly to non-governmental or UN agencies. Um, and that is, um, yeah, I think, something you know already. And when we look at how these 17 <coughs> CBPRs supported last year, 
on various different types of humanitarian action. We supported 686 partners implementing 1,400 uh, projects. And you see underneath and with the dotted lines in that box on how the EHF, meaning the Afghanistan Humanitarian Fund, responded. So we did eight allocations, which is the largest number of allocations any country-based pool fund has done on record. Um, we dispersed 63 million through mainly standard and reserve allocation protocols. So 30 million for standards, 32 million for reserves, 41 partners, and so forth. What we achieved there was a 7.7% a contribution or attribution rate to the humanitarian response plan for Afghanistan. That is something that is for us quite important also, keeping in mind that on basis on global discussions and requests also by the Secretary General in discussions with our donors. Uh, we are aiming um, for all country-based pool funds to increase their contributions um, to the HRP to 15%. So 15% of our target. Afghanistan last year achieved 7.7, which makes it the third highest uh, HRP contribution rate. And I think the only ones that contributed more, slightly more, was um, Iraq and Myanmar. So these 15 percent, this 15 percent is an important figure for us. This is also the basis of our fundraising activities uh, and discussions with donors that we have constantly <clears throat> in order to see that we achieve these 15 percent. And so in short, we're of course asking all donors that are willing to support a country-based pooled fund in any given country to also contribute preferably about 15 percent of their contributions through the country-based pool shop fund whenever, of course, there is one. And as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> my unit, we are about 14 people. We're also managing uh, surf allocations, uh, which are, of course, done in combination with uh, AHF allocations. So the idea, of course, and the plan is always to use both pooled fund mechanisms or both pooled funds in an holistic fashion. So there's no duplication and overlaps and things. Uh, and we dispersed last year one surf allocation of about 12 million. Um, are there any questions so far before I move on? I'll quickly check. Well, thanks, Jens. So far, I can see there are no questions. OK, fantastic. That's great. Good. Then let me move on. We about, so we managed. Oh, we earmarked about ten minutes uh, for this, and I want to take you over to the next slide, <clears throat> which is, I think, hopefully helping you a little bit. Uh, keeping in mind, especially those of you who are new to country-based pool funds, and it's all a bit of a new thing. Trying to get ahead around pool funds, of course, requires a bit of reading up, accessing information that is available online, maybe also discussion with people like me. And um, I try to summarize what I think are the most important information and resources that <clears throat> you would like to have, I think, whenever you, you come to a new country or decide that you want to apply for funding in a given country. And so the first thing that I always recommend is, is that you access the CDPF Global Guidelines and Annexes. So this is the core document that is uh, the guidelines that apply to all country-based pool funds worldwide. So all our internal or country-specific policies are always drawing from the Global Guidelines and the Annexes. So these are available on the Watcher Country-Based Pool Funds website. Uh, put the link in. It's the first one on the left-hand side. So that's where you can find all that information. And that already gives you quite an overview about how pool funds work, what they're supposed to do, what they're not supposed to do, and the likes. If you're looking at receiving funding or applying for funding in a given country, you will need to have <clears throat> the Humanitarian Response Plan, the HRP. Because everything that, of course, pool funds are doing is supporting the strategic objectives of the HRP in a given country. And since we're all working, or pool funds are working very closely and in support of the cluster system, uh, you definitely want to know the cluster strategies. So, for example, if your organization works in water and sanitation and wants to apply for funding there, you, of course, need to be a member of that cluster. Uh, we're also checking that organizations are actually a member and actively supporting the cluster. 
But you, of course, also want to know what this cluster actually has in mind for the remainder of the year. So as to see that any kind of activities you possibly want to apply for for CHF funding or EHF funding, or CVPF funding, are actually in line with not only the HRP, but also with the respective cluster strategies. So if the cluster strategy says um, we want to focus on, let's say, building boreholes in XYZ region, then other activities that you might be interested in might actually not be covered and as such are also then not eligible necessarily for funding for a country-based pool fund. When you look at the more fund-specific information, this is because as much as there is a global guideline in annexes, every country-based pool fund functions a little bit different and that is by design. The idea behind us is that whilst we follow a general modus operandi, we're also using country-based pool funds in a contextualized fashion, let's say, in order to best address humanitarian needs in a specific context in a specific country. And of course, no country is the same. And these fund specific information that I think you should be interested or would be interested in, uh, starts with first, you want to know who is in the advisory board and how is the advisory board composed. So we are all following the same design. We have contributing donors, non-contributing donors in the, in the uh, advisory board. We have INGOs, we have NGOs, we have observers, often the Red Cross is taking part of this one. And the advisory board composition, of course, tells you quite nicely. Uh, of who also else you can speak to and where you possibly want to do some lobbying, where you want to maybe get some additional information. And maybe you're also interested in joining an advisory board. Um, and country-based pool funds usually change the composition of their funds on an annual basis. Um, and yeah, it's a great opportunity, of course, to be part of the process on how country-based pool funds work, uh, getting a seat on an advisory board. Um, What's certainly also interesting is the type of donor contributions that you uh, that these country-based pool funds receiving. So what donors are sitting uh, in their advisory board, which donors are supporting as a non-contributing or as a contributing donor uh, a specific country-based pool fund. Um, allocation strategy papers are very important. Um, we have a global format which all country-based pool funds should use. So um, whenever you look at an allocation strategy paper, it look, should look more or less the same in Afghanistan than it does, for example, in Somalia. It makes it also easy for you to understand what a specific allocation is all about. And of course, it tells you in very detail of what now for a specific allocation um, the money is being used or should be used. And if basically the criteria on the mentioned the allocation strategy paper, uh, let's say the borehole, and it's not written in there, then also there is little chance that any proposal now proposing that activity that is not covered in the allocation paper is actually receiving funding in the end. Overview of allocation. Um, every country-based pool funds is disseminating dashboards, usually whenever an allocation was done, so you can see who's doing what where. We're also doing thematic dashboards, so the drought response, all the allocations that went for the drought response in Afghanistan have their own dashboard, so you can nicely see on who does what where with what money and which agency is operating under what cluster what activities, what target beneficiaries <clears throat> under this um, specific allocation. We we'll also do annual dashboards, of course, so you see an overview of what happened within the year. The central document of any country-based pool fund is the operational manual, uh, which includes, and I'll put it in brackets, the operational modality, which is often very important for you, also for partners to see and understand um, what is the maximum amount you can receive from this country-based pool funds in any single allocation. And this operational manual is being revised on an annual basis. So that is an absolute central document for you to have. Country-based pool funds provide it, of course, freely. They're publicly available. Most funds have them actually on their web pages. And if you don't have it, then give whoever is the fund manager or the colleague in that country-based pool funds you're interested in the call and ask them to email you the operational manual in the current version. 
Additionally, of course, annual reports are always interesting to have. They give you a good overview of what happened over the years or last year, for example, in that country-based full fund and how it operated. Lots of information, lots of details. And of course, any additional information that fund might have. So we've used now the example of Afghanistan. So information that I um, provide regular or that we provide regularly to our partners or partner eligibility process guidelines that are specifically important for new partners who want to go through the so-called eligibility process to see what it actually takes uh, in order to become eligible uh, to receive funding. So we have a due diligence process and we have an internal partner capacity uh, process. Those together form the eligibility process. And it takes a little bit of time and for a new organization also sometimes a bit of an effort to go through these steps. Um, the next one, of course, budgeting guidelines for partners. Um, Afghanistan, together with Nigeria and Myanmar, I think at the moment, have budgeting guidelines. And I think that other country-based pool funds will gradually roll them out more and more. Um, it's an important document because it explains to you all the various different financial aspects, how to conduct, how to, how to compile a budget, um, what's the story with the support cost, what are ineligible costs, what are eligible costs, what are direct, what are indirect costs, and so forth. Um, monitoring SOPs, every fund um, pretty much has monitoring SOPs, of course, that tell us, but also you, on how we monitor projects, and on what time you can possibly expect the fund to um, do a field visit or to contact you for information, on things like this, then what we're rolling out gradually this year is partner visibility guidelines in the past, which I did not require um, partners to um, use OCHA logos or fund logos. Um, we want to change this a little bit in order also to give, of course, our donors um, more visibility as to the projects that they're funding through country-based port funds. And what, of course, always is um, yeah, interesting to know, I believe, is what kind of training offers um, does a country-based pool fund offer to you as partners? Um, that can be the weekly clinics that we call them in Afghanistan, where you can just walk through the door and come into our office um, on a specific day during a specific time, and then we'd all just take time and answer your questions, no matter what they are. Or we are um, offering training events uh, every few weeks or every few months on specific topics that includes financial management, that includes budgeting and the likes, but also in general info sessions. And for example, in Afghanistan, we're meeting once a month at the INGO forum, let's say, or the NGO forum, that's ACBA. And that is a meeting that is usually about two hours long. Um, we leave it to our partners to decide on what they want to talk about. And then um, it's been used as an info session to give partners an update of what the fund is doing at the moment, when there's possible, possibly another allocation coming or any kind of changes and things like that. So I hope that blue box and my explanation helps you a little bit to get your head around country-based pool funds if it's rather new to you or you come to a new country. And on the left-hand side, I've put you the web links um, kind of to the most important sources. So A, the CBPF information on real-time data that goes pretty much for all country-based pool funds. But you can also, um, of course, look up individual details like say Afghanistan. And then of course, every country-based pool fund has also more specific information available. Um, and yeah, please do feel free to contact them um, whenever you have any kind of questions. Yeah? Okay. Um, Maybe I'll stop there for a moment and ask if you have any questions so far, anything you want to talk about. And the first question is that I see Afghanistan is persistently suffering from drought or flood. So how can CBPF address the flood issue in Afghanistan? So good question. And I mean it. Um, Afghanistan is certainly one of the countries that is persistently suffering from various environmental or conflict related aspects. Um, these things are not new. And of course, it's important that country-based pool funds in whatever manner they can support, of course, building resilience of populations and of course also uh, support sustainable solutions to persisting issues uh, such as, for example, drought and flood. So that is something that is of course very important to us. 
And when you look into, for example, the allocations that we did in Afghanistan last year, you see that while a certain amount or quite an amount, of course, was used to address the immediate uh, impact, the humanitarian impact the drought had on the population, meaning humanitarian life-saving aid, um, quite some money also started to pour into what we call sustainable solutions in order to address the underlying issues. However, we need to keep in mind with this one that country-based pool funds by design are there to respond to humanitarian emergencies. So basically we are strictly on the humanitarian aid side of the financing spectrum when it's about supporting uh, or addressing needs in the country. And what we need to do more and more, and it's a bit of a tricky beast sometimes, is of course to work together with our developing partners and to see on how developing or development funding can be put together with humanitarian aid funding in order to create more you know, sustainable and lasting solutions to persisting issues. And that is, of course, what we often discuss under the terms of uh, the nexus or the triple nexus. And it's still a bit of a beast uh, to deal with. And the easiest answer for me is to say, yes, we can, or yes, country-based pool funds that I managed, um, engage in supporting sustainable solutions, but we are still somewhat limited by the fact that humanitarian or that humanitarian country-based pool funds, like, such as the AHF, um, are to address life-saving humanitarian needs. And we're not supposed to use money, let's say, you now to reinforce, let's say, the riverbank that causes the flooding. You know? Okay, thanks a lot for answering the first question, Jens. Then there's another question. Will you expand your scope of interventions to other areas improving livelihood? Well, um, it is not the decision by design of country-based pool funds or me as the fund manager on where money goes. Um, it's always a decision that A, of course, is built on the humanitarian response plan, the HRP, which prioritizes which type of action in this specific period of time, multi-year HRPs, uh, single-year HRPs, where the money should go. And we also, of course, country-based pool funds should put the money in order to support. And on the other hand, of course, it's down to the cluster strategy, whilst we're working, as I said earlier, in support of the cluster system. So extending the scope of interventions to other areas, improving livelihood, yes, but it is driven by the cluster system, and it's driven by also the members of a specific cluster. So the member of the livelihood cluster in Afghanistan, their responsibility certainly is, is to work together as a group in the cluster to develop a strategy in, uh, in order to find ways on how to cover the livelihood ne uh, needs in Afghanistan. And of course, also engage them in discussions with us when we're designing allocation strategies on how the, the country-based pool funds can or should support their plans and their strategies. Then I see another question. How did you monitor your assistance in Afghanistan? Um, that is a good question. Um, bit tricky sometimes, to be very honest. Um, Afghanistan is not a country where, as you know, you can just quickly go around the corner, fly to a project site, uh, and have a look and see with your partner how things are going and discuss things on the ground. So we have to use various different types of monitoring modalities. And what Ocha did uh, in early 2018, we developed together the uh, monitoring toolkit for country-based pool funds. So that is an interesting document for you to have. Maybe add it on to the list of documents you want to have and want to know the monitoring toolkit 2018 for country-based pool funds. So this monitoring toolkit outlines the various different modalities we believe are available to country-based pool funds to monitor partner projects together with partners. Uh, no matter what the circumstances are. And uh, includes, of course, modalities such as field visits, where our staff are able to visit the project sites in Goda directly. It includes modalities such as peer review, where we are uh, training partners to monitor each other. If they're working, for example, in the same region, then let's say Oxfam is going around the corner 
uh, with a monitoring checklist and is monitoring a project DHF's funding with Save the Children, let's say. Then we have more, let's say, um, remote type of modalities that can include uh, a remote call center where we calling, we are calling beneficiaries and the agency provides the contact details. For example, you collect telephone numbers during our distribution and then we later call the beneficiaries and check with them on how they felt about the distribution, where they kind of issues and things like that. Uh, another modality that we're using gradually more and more in country based tool funds is third party monitoring. So it's the same what we're also now doing in Afghanistan. So we have a contract with a specific organization that does monitoring uh, for us in areas where, for example, we and the UN has issues uh, to go. And it still, of course, then enables at least a first hand look and somebody to be on the ground and to, to see things with their own eyes, let's say. And an additional monitoring uh, modality that we're trying now, and we've started this already in Iraq a few years ago, is to use satellite photography. And that, of course, means that in areas where we have severe access restrictions and it's extremely difficult to go there, and where it's maybe more about um, infrastructural products uh, rather than, let's say, um, collecting experience or feedback from beneficiaries. Um, let's use an example of camps. So for example, wherever we built, I don't know, 15,000 uh, tents, we can use a UN satellite and fly that satellite over the area and effectively count the number of tents on the ground and thereby physically or visually verify that these 15,000 tents, let's say, that we um, paid for or that the fund supported, um, I actually have been built and they're uh, literally on the ground or that the borehole that was to be so constructed in front of a health facility is actually there. Okay, then there's a question, how can we apply to become your partner? Yep, um, good question. That goes back to what I mentioned earlier in terms of the eligibility process or the eligibility assessment. Easiest way to start it is <clears throat> find the email address of the fund manager or go to OCHA, speak to the fund manager, sit together with him or her, and go through the procedures that they have in place in that specific country. Whilst we always have a standard approach, which is a due diligence assessment at the start, which assesses um, some core data such as um, do you have a bank account and country? Is it in the right currency? Does the bank account have the same name then your, uh, as your registration certificate with the local authority? Um, then we need a copy of the ID card of the highest ranking official. And then we usually issue you with an access password and name to go into the GMS, the grant management system used by all country-based pool funds. Everything is electronic. We do very little in paperwork and paper nowadays. And then getting into the GMS enables you to start with a checklist that will provide the internal partner capacity assessment. And that's then the step where we're asking you to share with us annual report, audit reports for the last two years, and all kinds of information that gives us a good understanding about the program capacity, program management capacity that the organization had. What is important is, is that after the assessment, the assessment always leads to four results effectively. Um, you're either being ranked as a low risk partner, as a medium risk partner, as a high risk partner, or you're ranked as ineligible for the next six months. That's the worst case scenario, of course. And this ranking, this risk level that we assign to partners after the assessment is telling you effectively also on how much money you can apply for for a single grant under a single allocation. And there's a table in every operational manual of every country-based pool fund that outlines the so-called operational modality. And this table tells you uh, nicely, if you're ranked as a low-risk partner, this means the maximum amount of funding for a single contract you can receive is, let's say, $750,000. And it also explains to you in that same table on what your monitoring requirements are. This means effectively the lower your risk level, the lesser reporting you have to do 
the higher your risk level, the more reporting you have to do. And also, if you're a low risk partner, we can give you pretty much most of the money, if not all of the money up front in one shot, one installment. Whereas if you're medium or high risk partners, we might or we will disperse the money to you in tranches. And before we give you the next amount, until we then eventually reach the total amount, we will do some monitoring activities and maybe want to do a financial spot check or maybe do a monitoring visit in order to be rest assured in terms of our risk management with US partners that the money is yeah, reaching where, where it's supposed to go. So there is one question from I mentioned UK as a major donor for the EHF. Do you have any idea how Brexit may be affecting the EHF? Hmm, good question. Um, I think your guess is as good as mine. And the only way basically I can, you know, or the only way I think or the way I think about it is that um, I've been watching carefully the news about two days ago, um, various different candidates um, for the PM in uh, the UK. And one of them, the current foreign secretary said that he would increase or at least maintain the level of development assistance and humanitarian aid the UK is providing. So that is a good sign. Uh, if he is the one who makes the decision later on, of course, UK is as good as mine. And of course, we're conscious, or every fund manager, I believe, is conscious that Brexit might have an impact uh, on us uh, and on funding received by country based pooled funds in the future. Um, I think we're all guessing at the moment. Um, I'm not hesitating uh, another guess in that direction, also without having more information. But let's have your yeah, fingers crossed that um, the UK as an important donor to country-based pool funds will continue to support CBPFs um, as before or as now. So <clears throat> there's a question, which areas will be covered under the 2019 AHF? Okay, so specific question for Afghanistan. What we're always doing is before any allocation is being dispersed to partners, we, of course, have several rounds of consultations with numerous groups and people before we decide on what we want to do with that fund. The way it usually starts is that every country-based pool fund does an annual general meeting at the start of the year where we meet together with the HC, who effectively leads country-based pool funds in the country. And my role is to manage the secretariat, also be clear about that. Um, and we discuss together with the HC and with the advisory board members of where we want to take um, funding in now this new coming year, let's say in 2019, um, and which areas we want to address as a matter of priority. So that's a discussion with our advisory board. That's also why we have an advisory board to listen to them and be guided and advised um, by them as to how to use a country-based pool fund. And vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, we are looking into the HRP, um, uh, country-based pool fund, being part of OTRA is always more or less um, um, playing a role also in writing the HRP. And of course, we're talking very closely with our partners, and that's the first point of contact, of course, the cluster coordinators. And we're discussing with them their cluster strategy for the new coming year. So all this information is guiding us then and guiding also new allocation, allocations. And talking about that, what is really important is, is that Country-based pool funds by design should not basically have, let's say, somebody like me sitting in an office uh, who is just, let's say, making up his mind about certain things and then dishing out allocations, uh, writing an allocation paper overnight and forming partners on the next day, and then you have three days to write a proposal, things like that. Um, but allocation strategies and decision on where funding is going should always be done together with partners. And when you look at the global guidelines for country-based pool funds, you also see that we have an actual flowchart for that, meaning partners on the ground define the needs or find the needs for where or for what now humanitarian action should take place. As soon as the partner identifies the needs, the partner should talk or needs to talk with the clusters and the respective cluster, discuss their 
on if this is a matter that should be raised to the attention if it's not known already um, of the country-based world fund. That means then the cluster coordinator usually comes to me and brings me a one-page draft strategy for um, constructing boreholes in a certain region or even better, the cluster invites the fund manager to attend um, a cluster meeting and to discuss basically the matter with partners directly and in detail. And following that, the cluster or the fund manager is then speaking with the unitarian coordinator and is saying, look, um, in my case, it's Toby, Toby Lanza. And I say, look, um, HC, uh, been talking to the wash cluster, and they believe it's urgently important that we release some money to build X number of boreholes in that region. There's significant need. Um, I've listened to everything. The story, let's say, is sound. I get their points. There's needs assessment. There's substantiating data and things like this. And then take it to the HC to see with him, keeping in mind, of course, the funding that we have available at that time on if this is something um, where we can possibly release an allocation or make it part of an upcoming allocation. And part of an upcoming allocation could be a standard allocation, um, which is a more, let's say, comprehensive process happening usually at least once per year. Or if we make it a specific reserve allocation, meaning an emergency reserve, and we disperse um, usually a somewhat smaller amount, but for a specific reason. So next question is, as I heard, health and nutrition is excluded from AHF. Um, that is not correct. Uh, the decision on what clusters will be supported uh, in the next standard allocation by the AHF is not final final. There was actually this morning in Kabul a meeting with the advisory board. And I believe the HC would like the AHF to support the nutrition cluster with a certain amount of funding. This is something that I'm going to discuss with him a little bit further today, tomorrow, if I can, before Toby then goes on break. And we will be in touch with the respective clusters um, as to what a final decision now by the advisory board uh, and the HC was as to what amount goes to which cluster for the next uh, AHF standard allocation in Afghanistan. Keep in mind also that whilst we might basically not always, our country-based pool funds might not always be able to support all clusters at a certain time, which is often or mainly due to availability of funding versus of these needs, most pressing needs, and there has to be a prioritization. The other part is, of course, that Working um, in my job allows us also allows me um, to synchronize or to harmonize of, of, of course, also at CERF funding. So meaning um, whenever we see we do not have the resources available in one pooled fund, be it CERF or AHF, we of course see how we can do this with another fund. And what I've done specific to that case that you're, you're mentioning. We are in talks already with the surf secretariat for about two weeks. There is now a new release of a surf emergency um, on an underfunded window. And we're currently looking into a possibility of um, either supporting or providing additional support for surf for prioritized clusters or to cover some clusters for AHF and some clusters for surf funding. Uh, we are not part of Ocha cluster, can we be included in that cluster? So any non-governmental organization, um, I'm guessing you coming up um, with an NGO background, can usually uh, see no reason why not. Um, be part of the cluster system. So what it takes is to go to the specific cluster um, in the area that you're working, let's say WASH or HEALTH, to contact them. If you don't know who to contact, please feel free to contact anyone in OCHA. Anyone will help you. Um, and get in touch with the cluster coordinator, for example, for HEALTH. And then discuss with the cluster coordinator, A, of course, and what they're modalities are, how often do they meet, um, where do they meet, things like this. But you can also discuss with them then on what their requirements are in order to support a potential application of your organization for funding. Meaning, what we're asking, and I'm 
pushing us a little bit more and more now in funds that have worked to be really clear that partners are actively part of the cluster system is that we're asking the cluster coordinator to issue a short letter or short email to the fund confirming that organization XYZ is a full member of the cluster and that the cluster is supporting their application for funding any future that will come. The importance in this one lies in the fact that the decision, the technical decision on which proposal is being funded by a country based pool fund is going for the so-called SRC and TRC process. SRC is for strategic review committee and TRC for technical review committee. And this is a committee composed out of people from that specific cluster under which the proposal comes in. So it's a WASH proposal that goes for the WASH cluster and WASH experts now assess this proposal for funding vis-a-vis are there any other proposals for funding that this cluster received? And the strongest proposals, of course, uh, have the strongest chance of, to re receive funding. Also, of course, if there's major issues with proposals, um, maybe that proposal is not going through. But that technical decision is made by the cluster and is not made by OCHA or people sitting in the country based pool fund or so forth. So there's another question. Do you have funding limitations to certain parts of the country in Afghanistan? No, we do not have any table that is telling me or us or the world that um, this is the maximum amount of money that we give to Baghdad and this is the maximum amount of money that we give to Jalalabad. So all our funding decisions and limitations are completely based on the HRP prioritization on the cluster strategy and of course, the availability of funds, uh, meaning money provided by donors to the country based pool funds. And as you can imagine, the more funding country based pool funds are available, the better we can respond, the more money we can disperse for a specific issue in a specific location, but also the wider we can possibly disperse funding throughout the country in order to tackle various different um, urgent matters and not just the most urgent one at a time. So the limiting factor is availability of funding, but not um, any strategy that we have in mind of where or where not to give money. Next question is, do you think your support was significant in response to the drought issues in Afghanistan? However, it was really effective. Okay, um, to be honest, I think the drought response of the EHF was not bad. <coughs> Keeping in mind also, the EHF, I think, provided the largest number or the highest amount of funding to addressing the impact of the drought last year. It was about, yeah, 60 million-ish. And I think the response could have been done a bit faster. So when we all look into this one now, I think um, we're all on the same page on that one. I'm not talking about any secrets or mysteries is that it would have been better, I think, to be able to respond much earlier last year and to mitigate the impact um, at an earlier time rather than, um, rather than the second part uh, and the latter part of the year. Having said that, you know that we um, dispersed eight allocations last year, highest number on record. And this was also because we gradually received money from donors in portions. And rather than now sitting on, let's say, that money and waiting for the next portion to arrive and then to do one big large allocation, we tried to give the money out to you or to give it to our partners as soon as possible. So as soon as we received funding from a donor, we immediately handed it out. And that basically is the main reason for why we did so many allocations last year, because we didn't want to see on the, uh, sit on the money and effectively be a bank, uh, whereas people are, are critical and have you know, in critical conditions um, for the drought affected regions. Um, what is important this year is to see, and we worked, um, I know that our coordination colleagues in the strategic and coordination unit, which I worked very closely together with the clusters over the last several months, is to um, write the so-called drought response plan um, that mitigates early on the impact of the drought, keeping of course in mind that drought is a repetitive issue. And um, it's not the first and not the last drought we've been responding to in Afghanistan. So my hopes is, is that with this planning together with partners, we are more clear at an earlier stage 
of um, cloud aspects, but also in terms of predictive financing, it will enable us as the Contributors Pool Fund to build funding strategies at an early stage together with our partners, and then hopefully also to be able to disperse money in an earlier phase. Um, what comes with it is, course, of course, also that not all aspects of the drought can be tackled by CBPF funding or SERF funding. And a lot of issues um, resulting in drought or the aspect resulting in drought are, of course, connected also to development support. So what is important for us is to work closely together with our developing partners, the World Bank, for example, or donors, countries that support development activities in Afghanistan. And many donors actually give more money to development than to humanitarian aid. Uh, and to see with them working in concert on how development money can be used most effectively in order to lower the chance or the need for humanitarian aid money to be used um, to respond. Next question is, do you fund single organizations or need a consortium of NGOs to apply? So we are always funding a single organization, meaning whenever a country based pool funds provides funding, the contract is with a single organization. We cannot fund a consortium. So uh, the contract holder, let's say, is Save the Children, but the contract holder cannot be ACBA or the INGO Forum of South Sudan or things like this. So that's a legal contractual term. So as such, country-based pool funds do not like or want to, and some people say should, to fund consortiums or consortia. Uh, but it means, of course, that providing funding to various different partners who are then working together in terms of their strategies, but also in terms of their activities in a consortium is, is, is absolutely possible. So um, take the example of, I don't know, Oxfam and Save the Children work in a consortium um, on X, Y, Z. They both receive individual funding. And the proposals individually with the EHS can, of course, be designed to uh, manage these two individual projects as part of an overall response, let's say. So and that is possible. But just purely for legal reasons, we can only fund or sign a contract with a specific organization that is also eligible to receive funding from the country based pool fund. Next question is what are the criteria for eligibility to select the partnership? Um, Good question. Um, eligibility to select the partnership, I think, is more addressed under that, I guess, and to how you select partnerships with other NGOs, for example. And that is something where we are not prescribing criteria um, on how you, for example, partner with, um, I don't know, Oxfam. Um, but what we do is, of course, if you're partnering with somebody and you're the grant holder or Oxfam is the grant holder and partners with you and parts of the funding go to a sub-implementing partner, then of course, whilst we're setting your proposal and before the grant agreement is signed, we are looking into how your relationship uh, is built. So is there an MOU? What is written in the MOU? Um, where do costs go? Um, where do expenses go? Who is responsible for what? So we're looking into this one and we're assessing that in terms of telling the contract holder, the prospective contract holder on if we technically agree with that partnership amongst you or if there are any kind of issues. And an issue could be, for example, if um, let's say NRC wants to partner with a local NGO that hasn't been blacklisted by a country-based pool fund because of fraud corruption misappropriation or things like that issues. That would be basically where we say, please do not partner. Um, we are not uh, supporting that. Or where an NGO, for example, would have been dropped out of the list of partners eligible because of any other technical issues. Next question, does the EHF prioritize the use of multi-cash uh, multi-purpose cash transfers, especially for addressing the needs of growing numbers of returnees from Iran? Absolutely. Multi-purpose cash or any cash-based intervention is something um, any country-based pool fund 
is supporting. And in fact, we have guidance also from Mucha and we have guidance from Mark Lowcock, uh, the EFC and USG, uh, who strictly directs us to explore options of cash-based programming whenever possible. And I've discussed the matter um, case of Afghanistan with Toby the other uh, month. Um, we discussed this also last year already. Um, Toby also as the HC is extremely supportive to cash-based programming in whatever way. And you also see that all our allocation papers last year, but we're gonna write this more, let's say clearly also this year, asking our partners to use cash-based modalities whenever possible. And that is something um, that we're very keen to in areas where cash base works, uh, of course, and where also we are involving now more this year, the Cash and Virtual Working Group in Afghanistan as a technical, let's say, a reference point for this type of activities, meaning any kind of cash base activity proposed to the EHF um, will technically be assessed by the Cash, uh, cash and Virtual Working Group to see with them that everything is in line in accordance with the required standards and guidelines. And that will form part of the, what I mentioned earlier, the strategic review process um, before any grant agreements are being signed. Um, and this for the last five years or so, and Afghanistan is now my fourth fund. Um, every country-based pool fund manager is setting a little bit the rules on how much and how much in detail they want to assess um, new partners in terms of their eligibility. I and mean, what was done, for example, in Afghanistan before I arrived last year in June was we had a very, very, very comprehensive way of assessing partners, which at some point included um, semi audits by KPMG, um, multiple visits to the office, uh, visual verification of all kinds of things, uh, a massive report written afterwards and so forth. And so just talking about Afghanistan, we had um, a backlog um, last year of uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of partners who got stuck or were stuck in the process for up to years. And what we've done last year is just to basically apply the minimum standard that has been prescribed by the global guidelines for country-based pool fund, funds. And we put dedicated staffing resources into this. So basically within a six months period, we were able to clear the entire backlog um, that accumulated going back all the way to 2014 and 15. Um, we currently have, I think, 105 eligible partners. That's quite a significant number. And when you start now this process, my best guess would be if you are an INGO and you are used to or you have gone through a capacity assessment in any other country, then you should have all the documents already in place uh, and available, meaning also a lot of the documents that we're asking for are actually HQ related. And so Caritas Germany might be able to provide documents that you used for an eligibility assessment in another country, not in Afghanistan, if you wanna do it there. And if you have the documents together and you submit them to us, it's a matter of days, maybe a week or so, for us to go through the documents, maybe ask one or two questions, and then we can complete the process. If you work for an organization that is relatively new or relatively young uh, and still basically not familiar, not so, not so familiar with bilateral funding directly from donors, country-based pool funds, it often requires you to compile quite some new data. So for example, you need to um, sign all kinds of waivers for all kinds of um, agreements with the UN as to data security, uh, reporting fraud, things like this. You might need a guideline that you haven't got yet in terms of how you're dealing with gender matters, with SGBV uh, and things like this one. And then it can take weeks to months but that's purely for the organization now to compile all the required documents. Whenever we have everything, it usually takes about a week or so. So do you reserve fund not expected or refund to donors? Oh, yes, this is Caroline yes. again. Okay. 
so sorry to interrupt, but I'm afraid we're running out of time now. Okay. There are a few questions left, but as Jens already told us, he would be available for further questions um, via email or telephone. Yeah. So this is very great. Thanks, Jens. So if you have any further questions regarding CBPFs, please feel free to contact Jens. And we are now at the end of our webinar. And first of all, thanks a lot, Jens, for giving us um, quick input on CBPS and of course for, for answering all the interesting questions. Thanks a lot for taking your time. I hope the questions and answers were useful for you and your work as well. Have a nice rest of the day and goodbye. Thank you again, Jens. Thank you so much. It's been really a pleasure. And yeah, please feel free to contact me at any time. I hope it was a little bit helpful what we've done. Um, and yeah, let's continue this and please contact me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jens.